the biological system I work with is figs and fig wasps. And because it's a relatively tropical, subtropical system, I did some um, experimental um, analysis in Australia. So I went to Australia. I had some live wasps to work with. And yeah, I'll explain what I did. So first, I'm going to see just a bit of an overview of what I'm doing, really. So figs, I'm not even sure if like you are aware of what fig trees are, but uh, in Australia especially, it's figs are everywhere. So figs are these really can be these really large trees that they support a lot of different animals, uh, a lot of life related to figs. So they are very important for the ecosystem and also they are very important for some particular insects that have adapted to figs. And these are usually the fig wasps. And we can have different kinds of fig wasps. So for example, the wasps, the wasps that I saw in my experiment were related to this thing called uh, ficus macrophylla. This is very, very common in Australia. Uh, and you can have some pollinating figs, uh, sorry, some pollinating wasps, some parasitoid wasps, which can be kind of large or they can be smaller with some different morphology as well. You can have galler wasps, so they are herbivores and they feed on the big resource, but they don't really pollinate. Uh, and yeah, this is also a different thing that I work with, Ficus rubiginosa, also very common in Australia. So what I wanted to do with my sampling is understand a little bit better how wasps related figs respond to temperature changes and specifically high temperatures, uh, which could be something that would be more, rele more relevant with uh, heat waves and climate change uh, in the future. So yeah, this is kind of the wasps I had to work with. So now I'm going to switch from this document to R. And this is also just a very quick mention that I made a map in R to show where my sampling was based. And that's something that is relatively easy and maybe it's for another day, but as you can see here, it doesn't really take that much effort. So yeah, not that that many lines of code to produce a map like this. It's a very simple map, but yeah. Uh, so my sampling was done in Brisbane, so on the east of Australia. And I'm going to explain a little bit my experiment now. So what I was doing is I was collecting figs and I let the figs uh, in, uh, in a container so that wasps can start emerging because all the wasps I saw you before that are related to the figs, they are born inside the fig. So if you have the fig, then eventually starts uh, wasps will start emerging after a few hours. So I collected some figs and then I brought them to the lab. And when wasp starts uh, started to emerge, then I would expose them to either of three temperature treatments. So I would either expose them to 39 degrees, 41 degrees or 43 degrees. So one wasp would either be in either of these treatments. And this wasp could be either a pollinator, it could be a color, or it could be a parasitoid. And this experiment lasted for two and a half hours. So what I wanted to see was what happened at the end of the experiment. If the wasp was alive, then I recorded uh, one. And if the wasp was dead at the end of the experiment, then I recorded a zero. 
So a little bit about. I hope I, I hope you can see my R screen. OK. Uh, so this plot here shows how my watch were distributed in the figs that I collected. So every circle is a different fig. And then the colors represent different functional group, groups of wasps emerged from this fig. Uh, so yeah, as you might be able to tell, pollinators and um, small parasitoids were more frequently encountered. And then large colors and large parasitoids were also encountered, but not as frequently. So as I said, those wasps were exposed to either one of the treatments. So at the end of the experiment, each wasp could either be alive or dead. So before we do the model, I'm going to show you what the data look like. So this is what happened basically at the end of my experiment. Uh, at 39 degrees, here I have separated um the two species of trees that I collected figs from. At the start of my experiment, oh sorry, at 39 degrees, which was my lowest experiment, most wasps of each of either fig species were found alive. And this is true for all groups. Pollinators, colors, parasitoids, they are most of them are alive at the end of my experiment. Then at 41 degrees, uh, things start changing significantly, at least to what our eyes can see. Um, almost half the wasps are found alive and half of the wasps are found dead. So here I say inactive, but realistically, they, they were probably dead. If they were not moving, this is when I, I Right, I recorded that they are inactive, they were probably dead. Well, if they were moving, they were active and alive. So at 41 degrees, there is a bit of response. Almost half the wasps are alive, half are dead. And then we can't, it's really hard to understand based on just looking at the data alone, how the different functional groups have responded to this temperature. And then at 43 degrees, we see a bigger change. Uh, less wasps are now alive. And uh, if we also see a bit more carefully, we see that very few pollinators are alive. And this is only true for pollinators coming from one fake host. So this is what my data looked like. This is what my observations where, so now I want to test this and see statistically whether. Bateria, but before we move from this figure, yes, um, I'm just conscious that um, maybe some people haven't encountered the fig and the wasp as a model system yet, and um, I wondered if you could say a little bit about a little, just a little bit more about about this ecosystem of um, wasp species that live in and around the diverse species of, of figs. And, and then um, maybe also just before we jump into the model, um, say a little bit about the predictions you might have for this temperature gradient for the different functional groups and just maybe fill it in because uh, you've been thinking about this a long time and and also I have because you've been telling me about it and it's so interesting, but there is a lot of detail to it that might be overwhelming for people that haven't been talking to you about it. Um, yes, OK, so I'll try to do that. So all of these fig wasps that I encountered are basically related or most are related. They are from the same family of wasps and they have all co-evolved with a fig, uh, yeah, with a fig plant. So their whole life history is very, very directly related to the fig. They lay the eggs usually either inside the fig wall, so the plant tissue, or if they are parasitoids, 
they lay their eggs inside other fig wasps who have laid their eggs inside the fig. So these wasps are by any mean very, very adapted to using the fig, uh, but they can all have very different roles. Uh, the pollinators are very specialized and they spend the majority of their lives inside the fig. They are born inside the fig and as they exit the transfer pollen, and they will bring it to the next fig that they encounter, where they were going to lay the, the eggs. So the pollinators are very, very much adapted to the fig. They have a very short lifespan. They only live, as adults, they only live a couple of days outside the fig. And then development usually takes a few weeks, and that's inside the fig. While for the non-pollinating wasps, so the parasitoids and the gallers, they tend to live a bit longer as adults outside the fig. So they have slightly different life history. Um, but yeah, still, they, they do require the fig as a resource. And um, yeah, ecologically also, they are different and they have different um, effects to the pollinators, let's say, because the gallers, they compete indirectly with the pollinators. They compete for resource because it's big and only cost, let's say, a number of wasps. So the gallers, um, they lay their eggs inside the fig, just like the pollinators, but they do not pollinate. So they are indirectly competing for resource with the pollinators, while the parasitoids, they directly affect the pollinators because they can be parasitoids of the pollinators themselves. So yeah, they do have different ecological roles. Um, and what I try, what I was trying to understand with my experiment is that, okay, we know that as temperatures increase, in, yeah, as temperatures increase, all insects usually live shorter lives. Um, so I was particularly, particularly interested in knowing whether the pollinators are affected any more or any less than the non-pollinators. Um, because even for an experiment like mine, which it only lasted for two and a half hours, for a pollinator that only lives one or two days, this can be a big part of its life. And temperatures at 41 degrees or 43 degrees are not, re are not really, really unheard of in Brisbane. They usually happen during heat waves. It's not something that happens all the time, but it is realistic, especially for the future with more heat waves uh, lasting longer and being frequent. So yeah, I was interested in knowing whether pollinators have this response to temperature in the first place um, and whether it is different for the different groups because they have, yeah, they have different roles. And also they can affect the neutralism with the figs because if the pollinators are affected negatively, then the figs uh, are also affected negatively because their pollinators are suddenly in a disadvantage compared to the parasitoids or the gallers, for example. So yeah, I thought it would be interesting to see the effect of the temperature itself, but also whether there are differences between the different, the different groups. Is that more or less enough, you think? Yeah, that fills in all the, the gaps. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so now to the model. So my response variable would be the status of each wasp at the end of the experiment. So either alive or dead, so zero, uh, one or zero. And then for the predictors, I have the temperature, which is one frequent. And then I have the group, which this wasp belongs to. And my group is separated by host and uh, functional group. So in my data set, I have separated all pollinators from one host species, from 
the other host, and same for the small parasitoids. For the gallers, because I only found gallers in one of my plant species, and I only found large parasitoids in my other species, they are already kind of split. So I will try to show you my data now. So I have already done some preparation so that we can only focus on the last part of the sprint, which is data end. Okay. So yeah, in my data set, I have information about which fruit each wasp is coming from, which tree, what species it might be, what functional group it belongs to. So the the column I use for my model is the column that is called host groups. So it combines information about my host and the ecological role of the wasp. And then the status column is the column that tells me whether it's alive or dead at the, at the end of the experiment. And my temperature column, yeah, it's, it's what treatment I expose the uh, wasp to. So to run my models, I have loaded quite a few libraries, which I'm not even sure if they are all applied, if they all apply to my data analysis. But yeah, we will we'll see. So how I start the structure in my model is that now that I have prepare my data, is that I'm using a GLM with family binomial. And then I did something slightly different than what I had uh, presented the previous time. Instead of using status as my response variable on its own, which is zero or one, I use this C bind operation which is something that I saw a lot of people were doing instead of just using the, the response column itself. So what this does is that it's practically the same thing for my, my own data. But what you do in this case, instead of providing just the status column, you provide the response column plus the maximum value you have minus that. Uh, response. So in my case, this will all be either zero, uh, zero or one, uh, one, zero. And this is maybe you could show us that in the console. Um, if you uh, is data dot end your your data object. Yes. If you if you down in the console. We'll type the um, function name attach, A T T A C H, <clears throat> open bracket, data dot end. And run that. And then if you'll just select the C bind um, function call, it should print it out in the console so we can just take a look. Should be either ones or zeros or zeros or ones on every row. And there's one row there for every wasp. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, it tells me that my first row, yeah. the status, because the status is one, then the second, the second column is zero because it's one. So the wasp was alive. Yes, so this was status this was one. Similar. Yes, we we went through this a few weeks ago, and this is one of the weird things about binomial um, regression is that as your dependent variable, you can uh, either submit it like this, or if your data are just zeros or ones, um, you can just leave it at zeros and ones, which I think would work for your data, but it, it works this way as well. I just wanted to show everybody what it looked like uh, for the data. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, it should be the same, but yeah, for now yeah. I keep this. So if this is my response. Then my predictors are the host groups, which are 
so or provided information about what wasp we are dealing with, and then the temperature treatment. So these are the things that I really, I'm, I'm really interested in. But then there is something else. There is the fruit. Because as I saw the, before, these wasps are not really coming from individual figs, so they're not completely independent. And I don't really have that many uh, fruits either. So the way I have done this here is to just add the fruit as a fixed effect. However, uh, I could also put it as a random effect. And that's something we were discussing also with Ed. And in my case, because of how I think it is because of how my data are structured, I couldn't really run the random effect model. Uh, so for now, I'll just run the normal model to see what happens. So we run the model, no errors for now, that's good. And then I tried a few more modules to see if anything else is better than my first idea. So this model here did not work for me, so I'm, I'm going to skip this. But the next model I tried to build is a very similar to the first one, but this time I choose not to include fruit as a as a fixed effect and just focus on the things that I'm really going to do. So I can also run this model. And I tried to run a model with only the interaction between my two fixed effects, but I don't think this is a good idea, so maybe for now I'm going to run it, but I don't think it was a good idea at all. And, and then in my final model, what I thought maybe I could try is that instead of using the host groups, as I showed you before, um, I use the guild column. So this one has similar information, but this time um, wasps from different hosts will have the same guild. So it has less information about the wasp, and it groups together wasps from the different hosts. So I run this model. I need to see which one would be better. And then in order to compare my models, I chose to go with the LIC criterion. So this, like I, this information criterion is something computational that I don't completely understand, but the lower it is usually, the better it is for us. So I calculate the AIC from all my models. Maybe I could say just a brief word about AIC is that um, <clears throat> there's this thing called model selection, let's say, and you use it in this case, you use it exactly like you've set it up here. And um, what the AIC is, it stands for Aikaki's information criterion. It's, an inform it's a way to quanti quantify the amount of information that a model explains. And... Um, but it's got a little twist to it, and um, you can think of it as a quantification of how much leftover variation there is after your model explains it. And but there are a couple of things to think about. Um, by definition, a linear model, the, the more explanatory variables, even if some of them are not very good, the more you have in your model uh, in general, the more um, in, the more information your model will explain, the more variance your model will explain. This is just a phenomenon of the way that linear models work. But the AIC penalizes that by model complexity. So every extra term um, penalizes this quantification of the AIC a little bit, and it balances the lowest number should balance uh, the simplest model 
that also explains uh, a good amount of variation. Uh, so it minimizes complexity. Uh, and it way it's weighted towards variables that um, explain a lot of variation. So here your model dot in dot guilds is the best model. And um, I didn't quite compare which what are the variables in all of those models. Can we scroll up and just look at the models? Yes. Uh, in the way well, in your script, it might be easier to read. Yeah. So, um, so gonna, I see. For now, I'm going to remove the random number. Yeah, OK. So like between these, you've got in your first model, you've got host group and the interaction effect with temperature and then fruit as a main effect. Then your second model, you've got host group and temperature, but no fruit, so it's simpler. Um, the last, uh, the third model, you've got host group uh, and temperature with the interaction. Oh, uh, so models two and three should be. Oh, and you have temperature. Let me see. Just the main effect for some okay. reason. Gotcha, gotcha. So I think that model might be. Let me see. They have yeah, the okay, same. Okay, that's different. So you, it's just the notation's a bit different. So that'll have host group, um, main effect, temperature, main effect, and the uh, the uh, interaction effect. So that plus temperature is redundant in that model. But never mind. And then the last one, you've got guild um, and temperature and the interaction effect. Yeah. So they are all quite different. <laughs> but the best model is the first one, like you pointed out. Yeah, so at least for now, I, I go with this model. So if I want to see the summary of my model, I would type summary. And then I have all this information about how the different categories in my variables, what, what is the estimate? So if it's Negative, it means that um, they have higher chance of dying. Well, if it's positive, they have, um, yeah, if it's higher, it means that they have a higher chance of surviving. And then I want to just say something else. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to mention that compared to what the logistic regression we saw last time is like none of my none of my none of my predictors is a continuous variable so all of my predictors are categorical so just that's something yeah just something to remember so if i run the anova for my module similar to what we did last week then I have some p values and degrees of freedom. Yeah, so it tells me that the post groups is a significant uh, factor, temperature is, fruit is, and then the interaction between post groups and temperature does not appear significant. However, when I did the post hoc, I did see some differences. And um, I was I wanted to ask you Ed, if you have any insights about this. About which one the um when you have the interaction that does not appear significant in an ANOVA, but a post hoc can give you can show you differences. Uh, with the summary? Um no, so I did the post like using e means. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a. This is kind of a thing where um, what you're asking with the with the interaction effect, the specific statistical question is. Um, is whether or not the. Um, let, let's say the. The temperature. Reaction. The, the temperature response is different for um, each of the host groups. Um, or are, are the lines parallel? 
it's hard to see from that figure um, what you're doing there, but you're if you imagine a a uh, a picture of um, the the average proportional lived or or died for each of the um, for each of the different functional groups and for each of the different temperatures. Um, you're asking if you drew a line connecting those dots, whether they'd be parallel for each of the um, the host groups. And uh, what this is saying is that they're not really different. All of the functional groups are responding similarly. If you do the EM means, let's just look at those results real quick. Yes. So, let me turn this so just so I'm going to jump to those. It might take a second for those to um, calculate. Maybe they'll go fast. Yeah, they're usually pretty fast. They're pretty fast. OK, so okay. let's see what's in the comparison host guilds. There you go. Let's OK, I'll, I need to forward them my screen even more. <laughs> OK. OK. Yeah, you've got some very long um, variable names there. Yes. Okay, let's let's just look at the beginning. So, yeah, this has the interaction. So it, it brings together the functional group and the temperature. This is and hard then, for me to look at because, um, well, one, and I don't see any significant p-values there yet. Are there some towards the bottom? Yes, there yeah. are a few, for example. This yeah, one, there are a couple, but even if there are a couple specific ones, you know what the when you get the result from the linear model, it's just washing out on average and there's not evidence for it on average across all of the functional groups. That's what it's 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 saying. Uh, when you look at these post hoc tests, you have to treat them with a grain of salt sometimes because um, even if you can scan it and say oh there's one that's significant you might um you might challenge yourself and say do i really have a specific prediction about that <laughs> and if you if you don't really I, I would it's easier just to interpret the overall interaction effect mm -hmm. so what that's telling you uh to me the overall interaction effect for the linear model is that um the means for the functional groups are I think that that was significant. Can you scroll up to look yes. at the ANOVA table again? Boy, that was a big table, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, the ANOVA table. Somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So what this is saying is that the the host group, the functional group, uh, is has different survivorship on average, and the next line says that um, on average the temperature matters and there's different survivorship of course your graph shows us that really clearly and then if you select the next line the fruit and you collected um i know this because we talked a little bit earlier um you collected a number of fruits and in each fruit was like this uh, whole ecosystem of minuscule wasps you took those wasps, identified them as far as you could, identified them and assigned them to a functional group, and then you randomly assigned each wasp you found to one of your experimental treatments. What, what this line tells you, the fruit line, is that um, you could see from your pie chart graph that, um, that there wasn't an equal balance of, um, of um, <clears throat> Of different functional groups and each one of those pie charts um, each one of those pie charts represents a different fruit within which you found a handful of wasps and what that line on the ANOVA table suggests is that the survivorship was not the same on average for the different fruits for all the wasps in the different fruits that's all it says um, you have a small number of fruits, but a large number of wasps. Okay, so if we focus on the fruits, um, 
that result for wh whether or not the fruits are different suggests that uh, it may suggest that there's actually a difference in the fruits. And it may suggest that um, there's sampling error. We don't we don't really know because you do have a small small selection and some of the fruits didn't have that many wasps. Sarah's asked a question in the chat about whether the fruits were different sizes. There were two species of trees. You can explain that maybe. Yes, so we have measured the fruit size because um, yeah, this this can make a difference. And for now, like some preliminary analysis, it doesn't look like. Um, but yeah, also we have to keep in mind that the differences, because I also did a post code for the fruit. And basically the differences that the fruit picked up was between two fruits having the same kind of wasps inside. And it was just a difference between those two fruits, really. So I feel like all this is coming from one comparison. So even if those two fruits had a different size, I would still not be able to relate size to the difference in response, if it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, um, that does make sense. But the, just to put a, a point on the last line on that ANOVA table is that the the non significant one there suggests that um, if you if you can you just go to your next graph the the bar the bar plot graph if you if you look there um, and you imagine there's six graphs there if you look at the top left graph what you'd see is that um, most of the wasps in the top left are alive and just a few are dead then if you look in the middle top it's close to 50 50 live and dead and then if you look at the top right most of the wasps are dead and a few are alive and um if you were to calculate the proportion well, and I'm just going to make up some proportions. The the left, top left, might be about 10% are alive, uh, dead. I mean, and the uh, the other one might be about 60% um, are dead, and the last one would be like 95% are dead. So there's this pattern of increasing proportion dead, and what that um, interaction effect suggests is that if you if you were to draw those three proportions of live and dead, but you would have, were to draw one point for each of the different functional groups and connect the lines, that uh, the lines are parallel. But they're not they're not um, lying on top of one another. The intercept for those lines is different. Um, we're told that by the temperature, by the temperature result, the main effect of temperature. So we know we know that um, I mean the uh, host group effect rather. The, so the host groups do respond differently on average. It's just that the shape of the response is the same for the different host groups. They're or at least they're not different. We don't have evidence they're they're necessarily the same, but we do not have evidence that they're different. Okay, I see. So basically, because that temperature uh, effect is so big. To notice any further differences in this proportional, you will need either more sampling or even a more important effect of the interaction. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that the the one little effect that we saw, or maybe there's more than one um, on the postdoc tests, com comparing all the possible different means. I just noticed that some of your numbers are quite small for the live versus the dead state. And yeah, you probably won't have very big statistical power, but, but it may also be that um, that these wasps all live in um, a relatively stable environment inside of a fig, and that they just don't have an adaptation to 
um, withstand hot temperatures and 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 that that is not different between the species. They're all quite small as well. I made a joke in the uh, chat earlier about how small your wasps were. I said I didn't mean it as an insult, but uh, I know some are bigger than others, but um, they are all quite small and um, small animals have this um, they have a lot of surface area. They're not like Tom's cows when it comes to shedding heat. Um, they can they can get hot fast and they they'll suffer for it because they're very small. <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Fred. I think I have a better understanding now about like the interaction and how the postdoc is related to this. Um, so after the ANOVA, I also calculated the R square, like using Ed's method. So as it is in the as we did it last week and as it is in the in the tutorial. But I also calculated something some other people do, which is Max Hayden's pseudo R square. So to calculate this, we need the deviance and the no deviance from your model. So this can be you can you can do this like if I don't need to type the values because if I just use this width and then the summary of my model, then it's going to be calculated. And this tell me, tells me a slightly different number. So yeah, I'm not sure which one I would, I would present, really. Do you have any thoughts on the words? Which one could be better or? Yeah, there. Th this is an active area of research, actually. Um, and it, the differences between these estimates of R squared have to do with um, with uh, assumptions about the covariance or um, um, especially if you have unbalanced data, maybe it handles the way that unbalanced data are weighted. So um, the pseudo R squared, um, I'd have to look at the citation. Um, Nagel Kirks is one that I have used myself in my own my own research. Uh, but you know, this is just an estimate and around this estimate, uh, is an error. And um, to me, 52% or 68% are not all that different. So uh, you know you're explaining a pretty good amount of variance with what you've got there. Um, there is a thing I wanted to caution you on. You, you were probably going to swing back around to this. Uh, we talked about it earlier. And that's the fact that, um, can you just run line 125 again so we have a fresh view of the ANOVA table? I just up here. Yeah, there it is. So if, <clears throat> one of the things is that um, there's this classic paper. I've mentioned it in here before. It's it's um, it's about this phenomenon in in ecology or any ex experimental biology called uh, called pseudo replication. And it is uh, you may or may not have pseudo replication in this experiment, but but a lot of people would err on the side of caution and say that possibly you do. And uh, one of the reasons why I would be concerned about it, I'd recommend thinking about this deeply, is two things. One of them is in this graph that you've just brought up, in, and that's that uh, you've got these different fruits, and you've taken wasps that were in the same fruit, and uh, it's possible that they're not independent of one another. Uh, the other piece of evidence is the thing that you might use a tool you might use to explore the independence. Um, if there was no difference in survivorship between the fruits, then you could treat it as a as a main effect and see if it mattered. And if it didn't matter, then you you might be able to argue that um, the the wasps were independent of the fruits, but it does matter, and, and it's highly significant in your test here. So you have much different survivorship in some fruits on average, irres irrespective of fun functional group than in others. And when you have these non-independent units, um, they one of the assumptions we make is uh, that each individual observation is independent. And um, we know that's not true for this 
just because of that line that says fruit matters. So uh, th this is a kind of a classic um, example of, of pseudo replication where you to stop at, at this model. So one way to handle it um, would be to treat. I know there are, are problems with the calculation of this uh, in your data set, but one, one the easiest way to handle it, if it's possible, is to um, is to treat fruit as a random effect. So this is this is analogous to a situation where you've got. Um, I get this kind of question all the time. There may even be some people in the call that um, I've talked to about this is let's say you have 20 cows for your experiment and you measure each cow once per week for 16 weeks. Um, let's say it's 10 cows for the sake of math. <laughs> and you measure them once per week for 16 weeks. You, you have 160 measurements. But if, if uh, Miranda, the cow, Miranda, um, you're not taking independent measures of uh, what's happening with Miranda, with whatever you're measuring. So it's, it's the same thing here. We know we're not taking independent measures of um, wasps from fruits. <clears throat> so I do think this is a challenge with this. I know I know it's um, it's um, I know it um, may not be possible because you have an unbalanced data set too. And, and some of the fruits you can just see on your pie charts. Um, now, just the thought, I can't, I've got to spit it out. It's it's like a fruit pie chart. Some of them, you only, one of them, you only have three wasps. And then um, some of them, you have well over 50. Um, so quite a large range and it's unbalanced because of that. And also some of them, uh, even though you have four functional groups, uh, I don't see any that that actually any one fruit that has all four functional groups. So they're also unbalanced in that. And it's because of those different kinds of imbalance that um, that it's probably having trouble running. There are, there are other ways to get around it. They won't be satisfying to you, but I'll say them anyway. Uh, one way to get around it would be to just to explore the problem. It probably won't wouldn't be a satisfying penultimate or ultimate solution, but uh, you could average the survivorship for wasps within each fruit uh, for for each of the guilds. Now you could do that, and that would get around the problem of pseudo replication. So it would affect the degrees of freedom, and you'd have to make certain assumptions for that too. But that would be probably something to try and that probably would run and then you'd be able to avoid the more complicated math behind the um, mixed effects model. Yeah, I actually did try to run this. The problem in this case is that because I group all wasps together that come from the same fruit if they are from the same functional group. So in case, for example, for the first fig U2 MA1, six wasps that are small parasitoids, I would group the response and take the average, and then I would do the same for the 58 pollinators. Yeah. The problem in this case is that I have very few data for some groups. Yeah. 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 It's um it's a hard problem. It'd be hard to get around that. Um you could reduce this problem down to a um a chi square kind of problem multiple chi squares that's that's another way to get around this problem you lose a lot of statistical power doing it that way but that is another way you could take it you could just separate you could treat the experiment as um, a rather than one unanimous experiment you could treat it because of the imbalance as a number of experiments you probably don't have enough for the large parasitoids and you you may not have enough for the large gallers, but for the others, you probably do just at a glance. Yeah, that's something that was also coming to my, my head that eventually I can start dropping. But then if I start dropping those groups, then immediately I have one, two, three, four, five, six or more, like at least six less fruits than I have, which is one third of my fruits. Yeah, so yeah, 
it's it's know. true it's true but if those fruits are ones causing the trouble uh, you because you have so few wasps from those few fruits anyway that may be the solution to your problem i think it's worth trying dumping them and not looking back and seeing what comes out yeah possibly <laughs> But yeah, okay, yeah. Um, okay, I kind of we kind of saw the post hoc here using e means and ls means. Ls means is supposed to be better if your actual measurements is not just like a, a logistic kind of model then. People say it's better to use the LS means instead of the E means. Uh, eventually, they run kind of with the same base, those two packages. But yeah, if I wanted to calculate the post hoc in every combination, for example, let's have a look at what means. Yeah, let's see the simplest case, which is the temperature, just to see how the post hoc looks like. I think we can try to do that. So, yeah, the highlighted text is going to compare from my model that I provide here and with the effect, fixed effect I provide here. It's going to make a table that it's going to solve the comparisons. So, then I make this a data frame because I, I, th I think I need it for laser dots. It's not important. And then I print it and then I get the contrast between my three treatments. And I can tell like my p values are significant in every comparison because yeah, the temperature each step has a different effect. So all comparisons were eventually significant. So using these LS means or the E means, you can either do a post hoc using a fixed effect, or you can also test the interaction. But you, you have to provide one thing, either one effect or an interaction term, but it needs to be one thing here. So if I print what I printed before, I printed the first one before, it was like many lines of code, so I'm not going to print it again. I'm just going to see if there's anything else that I wanted to say today. I so don't think we have time. Before we go on past this, um, can I just ask a question about this is a thing that we didn't get around to when we talked earlier, and I've never quite wrapped my head around this uh, for this, is um, if you're, you've, you've divided these groups out, so large gallers, large parasitoids, the pollinators, small parasitoids. Um, for the, do you have different predictions for those different functional groups or for some of these things, or are you just looking for patterns that might be there or any pattern, or is there is there some specific prediction that, that you are looking for in the first place? Yeah, so initially I thought that maybe the gallers and the large parasitoids, because they are both large, Maybe they can survive a bit longer in higher temperature. So my initial expectation was that the pollinators and the small parasitoids would have would survive less, which is not what happened eventually. Okay, and and but you've compared the post hoc means for all of these other things too, like the um, you know the fruits and. The the um the guilds the fruits the host groups and all possible combinations um and it was it just that you're really wanting to look in extreme detail at every possible thing or are some of those more interesting to you than others? Well, I think for the fruits, I needed to see exactly what the differences were because I was like, okay, now that I know that the fruit matters, then I want to know which ones are different. So I could look, I could see that. And then for the temperature, it was just a confirmation that all combinations were significant. 
And look at the fruits post talks. Yes, okay. It's gonna be a big table again. Yeah. yeah. Maybe another way to look at the fruit post talks would be just to summarize the, the um, average um, survivorship for each fruit overall. Because then you could just visually compare the heights of those bars. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I think I've done this and yeah, the, the results were quite similar. Similar, I think. So yeah, I think this the first line is basically where most of things happen. Oh, sorry. So yeah, it's comparing the first two fruits. Okay, well, th that's a good comparison because. Um... They're very similar and have the same guilds. Yeah, so basically, because my model has taken into account the yield and temperature, uh, it's not going to compare fruits that do not have uh, wasps of the same kind. So that's yeah. why it cannot estimate fruits that have different guilds. So, which is a limitation because I only I can only compare fruits that are I have the same kind of wasp. I, I think I'd be tempted to to just look at this in a cruder way. Um, see you, Jimmy. Uh, and just summarize them by by fruit. Sarah also has a question in there. Um, whether you can see wasps inside the fruits all the time, or do you need to cut the fruit open to see the wasps? That's a good question. See, I, I was afraid some people hadn't hadn't uh, didn't know the wasp and pig story. Uh, so if you cut open a fig at the right stage, you will see the wasps. But if you cut it when it's immature, then the wasp will probably still be developing. Uh, but yeah, you might be able to see the developing larvae, for example, inside the fig gulls. But then the problem is that once you open the fig, then the wasps will stop developing. So what you usually do and what I also did is that I just let wasps emerge. So whatever emerged and was an adult is what I used. I didn't really do any dissections for my experiment. I think it's the case that um, maybe this might be an ignorant biologically ignorant statement, but I, I think it's true that for some figs, maybe all figs, maybe most figs, that the the reproductive structure um, during its development first has flowers and then turns into the part that, you know, in fruit and figs that we eat um, develops into the fruits. And um, that for some of these species of wasp, they spend their entire life cycle um, in, in the fruit. And it's only one of the sexes that disperse in some species. Maybe both sexes disperse in some. So you don't see any wasps when you come up to the fig. Usually, they're all they're all inside the fruit structures. You will see some parasitoids usually hanging around the fig because they the ones with the long ovipositor they do lay their eggs from the outside. Hmm. So yeah, if you sometimes you can see the parasitoids outside the fig. Well, thank you, Soteria. We're out of time. I know you said you had to go at five, so um, thanks I'll just very much. Run yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry that it, there was not really too much time left for any more discussion. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I think it showed us some of the complexities of data analysis, and you've really uh, been thinking hard about this stuff. Um, so thanks for coming, everyone, and we'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks Bye. again, Soteria. Bye-bye. Thank you.